This is a lecture on Freud's, Sigmund Freud's Moses and Monotheism, part one and part two. Now, in this lecture, we're only going to be dealing with the first two parts of, uh, of his argument, which he wrote early on before he left Vienna and relocated or immigrated to London in the context of Nazi persecution. And the second part deals more with, he, he revisits some of the theses that he first introduced in his book, Totem and Taboo, a number of years earlier. Now, on the same channel, I do have two lectures on Freud's Totem and Taboo, which also uh, work fairly extensively with Moses and monotheism from the third part of this book, where he goes more deeply into questions related to what he calls the father horde uh, and, and the brother clan. And, uh, and so that material is covered, but it's not covered in this lecture. In this particular lecture, we're going to be focusing very specifically on the question of what Freud does with the, with the uh, historical biblical figure of Moses and the argument that he sets forth, which has uh, spawned a great deal of commentary and criticism since it was first published. Now, this was the last book that Freud published, or the last book that Freud wrote, anyway. And, uh, and, and uh, it, it's interesting to note that it has proven to be very compelling, not only for people interested in psychoanalysis, but also for Egyptologists as well, who have been inspired by this book and by some of the theses that he sets forth. So... Uh, it's a controversial book, uh, but it has been also a very influential book, and it, uh, it certainly is one that remains relevant today as scholars continue to write entire book-length commentaries on it and see how it applies to the situation of the world that we live in today, as opposed to the context within which this was written in the, uh, in the early days of World War II, prior to Freud's death. So as uh, you can see here, here's a picture of Sigmund Freud. He lived from 1865 to 1939. Now, Totem and Taboo, which he revisits in this text, many of the theses that he sets forth, again in part three, not so much in parts one and two, which we're going to be exploring here. Um, uh, that was published, you know, 20, some, you know, 25, 26 years before this particular book was written, but he he finds that many of the theses that he set forth in Totem and Taboo still quite compelling. But this book, he even Freud even himself describes it as a kind of a novel. And indeed, it reads something like a novel or something like a detective story. And, you know, Freud is, is studied today perhaps even more in literature departments than in departments of psychology. And he, he is a very interesting writer just from a sheerly uh, literary perspective but this was uh, one of the last things that he wrote and uh, and as Edward Said is going to argue in his book Freud and the non-European it is an instance of what Said is going to call late style which is a kind of a style that he argues that is um, uh, that one finds in in the later work of say for instance Said's uh, quotes the or cites the uh, the, the composer Beethoven, who writes his later compositions are very idiosyncratic and almost seem to be written for himself with a certain kind of indifference for his audience. And, and, and so in this sense, they, they, can some, they can seem to be uh, inaccessible to those who are looking at them from, from the outside because they can be quite difficult. But um, whether or not this qualifies as an instance of light style, uh, I think there's aspects of Said's uh, you know, argument that are that are relevant here, but it, but at the same time, it remains quite uh, readable. At least the first books, you know, are parts one and part two. Uh, part three does get a little bit more dense and a little bit more uh, difficult. And so I think that's more representative of what Said is calling the late style in Freud. But in any case, he, he's a quite enjoyable uh, uh, writer to read. And I and I want to note here as we're getting started that. These, I'm presenting these ideas for those who are new to the thought of Freud. So we're not going to go terribly deeply into questions of psychoanalysis. We're just going to look at the question of what he does 
with the historical personage of Moses. And, and let's note here from the beginning that the reason why Freud had to flee Vienna and migrate to London was because he was Jewish and the Nazi party regarded uh, his you know, psychoanalysis, they described it as a Jewish science in effect. And so, uh, you know, Freud is writing again as a Jewish man, but this, this is relevant as well, because even though he's writing as, as a Jewish man, what he says in this text is something which he's quite aware his Jewish readers may not be terribly happy about, particularly those of his readers who are observant in their, uh, in their, in their spiritual orientation to Judaism, because his, his thesis is quite provocative and it, it uh, overturns many of the basic ideas that that, uh, that that one has held for centuries and centuries about the prophet Moses and who he was in Judaism and in, and in the three Abrahamic traditions more generally, because let's remember as well that, that uh, Moses is an important figure not only for Jews, but he's also an important figure for Christians and for Muslims. So again, the, the context of the narrative uh, as composition is, you know, it's the early days of World War II. And, you know, uh, Freud did not live to see what happened with the death camps, with the concentration camps. Uh, he, he sensed the disaster on the horizon, uh, but he, uh, he, he didn't live to see it come to fruition. He died, you know, prior to the, the conclusion of the war. And as you can see here, if you look on the map where Germany is, well, you know, Hitler himself was from Austria, and in March 1938, uh, he uh, annexed Austria to Germany and made it part of the Nazi German uh, empire that that, he, that was growing at that time. And so uh, it, it became, it just simply became impossible for, uh, for Freud to continue living in Vienna and for many others who are practicing psychoanalysis. And although not all of those practitioners were Jewish, ma many of them in effect were, and, and, the, and the Nazi party looked down on psychoanalysis as a kind of a Jewish science. And I think in part, this is linked to the fact that question for Freud, especially of circumcision was so important to psychoanalysis, the trauma that is circumcision is, is uh, central to, for instance, Freud's theory of say the castration complex, for instance. So in any case, the, the Nazis and Hitler uh, didn't like psychoanalysis much and they didn't like Jews either. And so, uh, you know, Freud, he, he fled to London and he, uh, that's where he, uh, he died and he didn't live there very, he didn't live much longer beyond his immigration from Austria to London. Okay, now as we begin, I, I have to be cognizant of the fact that many of my uh, listeners, my students, for instance, at Western Washington University, are not necessarily uh, steeped in the Abrahamic traditions and don't know who many of the, the, the founding figures are. And so just uh, by way, quickly, of review, we can't dwell on this too long. I do have also on this uh, same channel, I have lectures on the three Abrahamic traditions, the peoples of the book and uh, on the, my scriptural literature series. And so if you're interested in that, you can pursue that, but we're gonna go through this quite uh, rapidly. What I really wanna focus on here at the beginning is if we look and see the uh, sort of the family of, uh, or the tree of, of the prophets, let's look start on the right. This is an Islamic version of the same uh, history. You can see at the very bottom of that tree is, would be Adam, the first man. And as we ascend up the tree, we have the prophet Noah. You can look there on the other side and you can see Adam and Noah on these genealogies that are established. Um, and then if you look on the Islamic you know, version of this, you see to the right, the first, uh, well, if we go up a little further, we see the prophet Abraham. This is all of the religions of the book are linked to the figure of Abraham. If we go further up the tree, we see Moses. And then further up that we see Jesus. And then to the right, with the, with the bright sort of shining uh, flower. This is of course an Islamic version of this history is Prophet Muhammad. Now the Prophet Muhammad is the most important for Muslims. Freud does address the question of Islam briefly in Moses and monotheism. And, uh, but for Jews, Moses really is, is the most important figure. We can say in effect that if the Prophet Muhammad and Islam is in effect the seal of the prophets, 
there are prophets after Moses. There are no prophets after Muhammad if you're Muslim. But none of the prophets for Jews, none of the prophets that come after Moses are as significant as Moses because it's Moses who is given the law. He is, he's the lawgiver, receives the Torah and Talmud on Sinai. So he's a particularly important figure. But again, not only for Jews, but also for Christians and for Muslims. Now, um, if we look on this genealogy to the left, we can see, you know, we have Adam, has, there's Cain and Abel. The story Cain uh, kills Abel. And then Adam has another son named Seth. And Seth, you know, that Noah comes from the, the lineage of Seth, as you can see. And then uh, this is Noah. This is the figure of the flood when the earth is filled with water and everybody is killed except those on Noah's ark. And he has three principal sons, Shem, Ham, and Jabbath. Okay, now I wanted to mention Shem especially because when we think about Hitler and anti-Semitism, we can think of, uh, you know, the, the, the etymological root of the word Semite uh, comes from this word Shem, Shemite. So uh, to be Semitic is Shematic. And so to be anti-Shematic or anti-Semitic would be to be anti all of those descendants of Shem. Now, it's worth noting, too, that uh, the term anti-Semitism is commonly associated with uh, anti-Jewishness, particularly in Europe and, and the United States, but uh, but uh, being somatic as as a kind of ethnic identity is obviously not limited to the the Jews as well, but also say for instance will include uh, Arabic peoples who are also uh, somatic in this in this sort of mytho mythological genealogy or biblical genealogy that's handed down to us. Now, if you look down a little bit further, for instance, you can see. Shem, that Abraham, who is the, uh, the, the figure that all of the Abrahamic traditions trace their lineage back to, is uh, an ancestor of Shem, who would be his grandfather, in fact, and, uh, and his three, uh, or would be in, in, in the lineage in any case of Shem, and his uh, sons, his two oldest sons are Ishmael and Isaac, and uh, Ishmael, if, if you're Muslim, if you're, let's say, uh, in, in the Hashemite lineage, if you're Arabic, like the Prophet Muhammad, you trace your lineage, uh, Prophet Muhammad traces, and the Hashemites trace their lineage from Muhammad to Ishmael to Abraham, and whereas uh, Jewish peoples trace their lineage to Abraham through his younger son, uh, Isaac. Now, Isaac's uh, mother was Sarah. Ishmael's mother was Hagar, the uh, Egyptian. So, but in any case, they're both uh, linked to Abraham ethnically as well as spiritually, and they're they're both uh, somatic or shematic. So, when we hear this word shematic, we want to think of uh, somatic. And the Nazis that um, that that Sigmund Freud were confronting were anti-Semitic. And one, one of the things that really is in the backdrop of this text, the historical context that we find Freud meditating upon, is what, what is the basis? You know, why is there so much hostility to Semitic people in Europe? And he's speaking as a man who is himself Semitic or a man who, who is himself Jewish, who's lived you know, almost at uh, this time 80 years in Vienna now he has to leave his home. And so he's really, the, the whole question of who Moses is and what is Moses's identity is linked in some sense to, to for Freud to this puzzle or this problem of anti-Semitism that he sees very, very clearly on the rise in Europe. And, not, and this is not just a theoretical matter for him. This is something that has uh, affected him personally. Now, as you can see here, here are some uh, propaganda posters from this period, and you can see some of the, uh, the, the, the terrible propaganda that is associated with, um, you know, Jewish people. Like in the middle, you can see there, you know, tuberculosis, syphilis, uh, you know, cancer. Uh, and then on, on the far left, you see a, a kind of a devil figure who is, uh, you know, carrying the Talmud, which is said here, called here the recipe book of the devil. So the Talmud itself, which is one of the, which is a holy book, if you're Jewish, is 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 uh, 
described in this anti-Semitic, uh, you know, these posters and literature that circulates as literally demonic or, or evil. Now, again, uh, for those who are not Jewish, the Torahs would be the first five books of what Christians call the Old Testament. Uh, Pentateuch is another word for that. The, uh, but in Judaism, the Torah is the written law and the Talmud is the oral law. Both were transmitted or believed to have been transmitted to Moses on Sinai. So uh, the, the Talmud itself, you can see, is being stigmatized in this uh, anti-Semitic poster. Now, uh, prior to Freud, we have this the figure of Theodore Herzl. And we're, we're just going to mention him in passing here. I do have on the same channel... A, uh, a lecture on Theodore Herzl's book, The Jewish State. But as you can see here, Herschel lived from 1860 to 1904. So, you know, he, he would have died, you know, many years or many decades, three to four decades before Freud in any case. And uh, his book, The Jewish State, which outlines the case for Zionism, which I will, I'll read you a quote from in just a minute, would also be at the backdrop of this. So we want to bear this in mind when, when Freud speaks of Jewish nationalism in Moses and monotheism, he's, he's thinking of the rise of Zionism inaugurated by Herzl. And so it's not only the question of Nazism and, and anti-Semitism that, um, that forms the historical context of this uh, of this book that Freud writes, but also in the backdrop of this is is the growing Zionist movement that was um, again uh, that, that, that that Herzl was in some sense the architect for at least he provided a written blueprint for Zionism, and uh, and and Freud we're going to see was uh, was was ambivalent about Zionism. We find there are different points in Freud's life where. He said things about Zionism that were, you know, relatively affirmative, and then he said things that were also quite hostile. And in, but in this particular text, he doesn't exhibit a whole lot of sympathy for Zionism. He's quite critical of it. This is a point that Edward Said is going to pick up on in his book uh, Freud and the Non-European uh, as well. But uh, so I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but I just want you to be to this. To, have be something in the backdrop of your thinking about this text that Freud produced in terms of it frame, forming the historical context, because Freud was certainly very much aware of it, and he's 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 aware of his Jewish uh, audience, the, his Jewish readers, and not just his Jewish readers, but his Jewish readers who are looking towards the ideas of someone like Herzl as a possible solution to the problem of anti-Semitism in Europe. And, you know, what Herzl's basically, you know, Herzl's argument, as we're going to see, is essentially an existentialist uh, argument, or it's an existential argument. It's basically, look, you know, Jews have been living in Europe since the fall of uh, Herod's temple, some, you know, 2,000 years earlier, since the Romans uh, smashed the temple and uh, forbade uh, Jews from living in Jerusalem and Jewish people dispersed, you know, all, all over the world at that time. He says, you know, Herzl's basically going to say, well, we Jews have been living in Europe for many, many centuries, and we've tried to assimilate, but they're not going to, European people are not going to let, they just won't let us assimilate. And so we need to have our own state because uh, otherwise, you know, these pogroms, these attacks on us, which as we're going to see culminates in, in the death camps in uh in, in World War II are just are just going to continue unless we, the only way Herzl's going to say basically that we can protect ourselves is to have our own state. So his argument is not necessarily an ethical argument; it's more of an existential argument. Uh, we'll we'll return to that, but let me just read a couple of quick quotes from Herzl's uh, book. He says the Jewish question persists wherever Jews live in appreciable numbers. Wherever it does not exist, it is brought in together with Jewish immigrants. We are naturally drawn into those places where we are not persecuted, and our appearance there gives rise to persecution. This is the case and will inevitably be so everywhere, even in highly civilized countries. See, for instance, France, which has a history of anti-Semitism, so long as the Jewish question is not solved on the political level. So you can see 
you know, he, he's searching for a political solution to the problem of anti Semitism. And basically, he's going to conclude that if the Jews need their own state, that's the only way that that uh, one is going to be able to uh, escape the kinds of ongoing persecution that, that are taking place. Here, let's continue. He says, therefore, I believe that a wondrous generation of Jews will spring into existence. The Maccabeans will rise again. Uh, and let me uh, just for context, the Maccabeans are those who, uh, when when Palestine was colonized by the Greeks, Hellenized, and uh, let's say, for instance, a, a statue of Zeus was built in, in the temple in Jerusalem. The Maccabeans were a tribe of warlike uh, figures who came in and cleansed the temple and in a military way drove out their, their uh, colonial oppressors. And this is what is, for instance, celebrated at, at Hanukkah. So he's saying, yes, once again, there will be a rise of Maccabeans, which is to say militant, fighting Jews will rise up. Uh, this is this is the political solution that we need, he's saying in effect. Let me repeat once more my opening words. The Jews who wish for a state will have it. We shall have it, we shall live at last as free men on our own soil and die peacefully in our own homes. The world will be freed by our liberty, enriched by our wealth, magnified by our greatness. And whatever we attempt there to accomplish for our own welfare will react powerfully and beneficially for the good of humanity. So this is the Jewish nationalist argument. And the word you know, Zionism means, in effect, Jewish nationalism. And this is the argument that Herzl is articulating and that Freud, when he wrote this book, was very much aware of, just as he was aware of nationalist socialism. These are two the most two most important contexts in the backdrop of this text composition, this argument that he makes about the historical personage of the prophet Moses. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm assuming my readers are not that steeped in uh, in knowledge of the Abrahamic traditions. And so just very briefly, I, let, me, let me say in passing, if, if you're not, if you don't know who these figures are, you really should educate yourself. I regard this as a part of basic uh, you know, cultural, religious literacy for uh, functioning in the world today. But again, Moses, if, if you're Jewish, Moses is, is the most important prophet. And we can see here, if we look at the dates from, uh, this would be the Orthodox rabbinical Judaic uh, version of the dates of Moses's life. And of course, Freud's going to be wondering, you know, if, if was, was Moses even a real person or not? Or was he a legend? Was he a myth? But according to rabbinical Judaism, he was indeed a real person, and he lived from 1391 to 1271 BCE or before uh, the Common Era. So this would be, let's say, 1,400 years before the birth of Christ and uh, some 3,400 uh, years ago from where we are now in history. Now, uh, as you can see on the far right, there's Charlton Heston as Moses in the popular 50s film, The Ten Commandments, Receiving the law on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And in the middle, you have a Michelangelo sculpture, very famous sculpture of Mike, uh, Michelangelo made of Moses, the lawgiver. And there uh, next to the uh, Ark of, or an image of replica of the Ark of the Covenant, which is what um, uh, when, when, the, uh, when, the, when Moses receives the law, he comes down from Sinai and finds his followers worshiping a golden calf. And so he smashes the, uh, the, 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 the tablets and there later, the pieces of it are gathered up and put inside the Ark of the Covenant, which is an important part of uh, the Jewish tradition. It's, it's in cases and houses the law. Now on, on the left, you see uh, a painting of, of the parting of the Red Sea, which is another important legend associated with Moses is that when he freed his people from bondage in, um, in Egypt and brought them out, uh, he he led them. The Pharaoh chased them, and he they crossed the Red Sea, and a miracle happened. He held up his staff and his arms, and the the, the biblical text tells us that the Red Sea parted, and the Hebrew slaves were able to pass through it. But then, when Moses puts down his arms, the waters crash in upon the men of the Pharaoh, the army of the Pharaoh that's that's pursuing them. So these are just a few of the uh, stories associated with Moses that one finds in the book. Of Exodus in the biblical text. Now, here's what Freud has to say at the beginning of this. 
Now, bear, bear in mind the, the context that we've just been discussing as, as we uh, listen to Freud speak here. Freud's going to say at the very opening, to deny a people the man whom it praises as the greatest of its sons is not a deed to be taken lightheartedly. This would be Moses, especially by one belonging to that people, Freud himself. So here, here he says, here I am, a Jewish man who's denying to the Jewish people uh, that the greatest of its sons, Moses, is even Jewish in effect, as we're going to see you know, in his argument that Moses is an Egyptian. Uh, no consideration, however, will move me to set aside truth in favor of supposed national interests. Okay, now there's another point worth stopping on. This little phrase here, no consideration, however, will move me to set aside truth in favor of supposed national interest. Now here, he's alluding very specifically to the Zionist movement, which remember, Israel does not form until after World War II. It was not, uh, it had not uh, formed at this time. And so the, uh, you know, what, what he's basically saying is that, it, you know, there might be people, Jewish readers, especially Zionist readers, who would say, look, even if you're right, Mr. Freud, you don't have to say it. Don't say it because there's too much at stake right now. We're trying to get uh, a nation state off the ground that's a Jewish nation state. And so maybe we should just, you know, maybe it's best to just be silent on this question. But, you know, Freud is, is very clearly, he's, he's going to say truth, the question of truth itself comes before these, this question, what he's calling supposed national interests. And so this seems to be a very, uh, almost breathtakingly hostile uh, view about the importance of the Zionist movement. Well, that's, that's of course, debatable. Different critics have different thoughts about that. But I, whatever your view is on that, I just want you to be aware that that's what he's talking about here. Moreover, the elucidation of the mere facts of the problem may be expected to deepen our insight into the situation with which they are concerned. The man Moses the liberator of his people who gave them their religion and their laws belong to an age so remote that the preliminary question arises as to whether he was a historical person or a legendary figure. Although the decision lacks final historical certainty, the great majority of historians have expressed the opinion that Moses did live and that the exodus from Egypt led by him did in fact take place. Okay, so uh, Freud is going to seem to be affirming this idea that yes, indeed, Moses was a historical personage, not a mere legend, and there was in, there was some kind of exodus from Egypt that took place, and this is what he's uh, going to be uh, exploring. Okay, now the thesis that he raises, you know, is that Moses was not a Hebrew slave, as he's described in the biblical text of Exodus, but he was in fact himself an Egyptian. This is basically going to be uh, Freud's thesis. And this thesis, which is very provocative, very controversial, is going to have a great number of consequences or implications. And I, I just want to, you know, we, we can't talk about this except in passing, but I just want you to be aware that there is a vast literature out there that has been spawned by this thesis that Freud advances in Moses and monotheism, that Moses was indeed an Egyptian. Now, if you look to the far left, Jan Asman wrote a book called Moses the Egyptian. Now, Jan Asman, along with Eric Hornig, is, is one of the most prominent and respected Egyptologists who, who work in the field of Egyptology, and he's written an entire book exploring you know freud's proposition that moses was an egyptian and he takes it very seriously and, and, and as a trained egyptologist finds much about freud's views uh to 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 recommend them and so even though freud is not an egyptologist he's a psychoanalyst here we find an, an egyptologist uh, affirming much of what freud has to say and so if you're interested i do recommend this text jan asman is a very interesting scholar and this is a very carefully constructed text um, that has many many provocative uh, questions uh, involved in it now uh, others we're gonna i'm gonna ha i have another lecture in this same series
on Edward W. Said on the far right on his book, Freud and the Non-European, where he's going to examine very carefully the argument set forth by Freud in Moses and monotheism. But um, the, the three texts in the middle, Freud and Moses, Freud's Moses and Archive Fever, these are all written uh, advancing, and they're, they're by Jewish authors, and they advance the idea that Freud was perhaps more Jewish than many people give him credit for. And, and, and what we, uh, which is to say, in effect, that like uh, Peter Gay, for instance, who's a very prominent uh, scholar of Freud, has written a book called The Godless Jew, which has argued that, you know, Freud was an atheist and that he ethnically, yes, he was Jewish, but in terms of his own spiritual religious identity that he was he was a very staunch atheist and was not you know did, didn't see himself as being you know religiously jewish in any way and uh and these texts uh, explore this and uh, for instance uh freud's moses by yura shumali in the in the middle is makes a very strong and carefully argued case that freud this being the last book that freud wrote uh, before his death that we find in it, Freud, in, in some sense, rethinking his Jewish identity and perhaps even affirming aspects of it that he did not affirm in some of his more uh, enlightenment, rational, secular work throughout his career. And, and this was proved very inspirational, for instance, for Derrida, who does a very careful reading of Freud's Moses by Yerush Shumali in his book, Archive Fever. And then Freud and Moses is a more historically uh, oriented approach. Also very interesting look, uh, look at these same questions. So um, I, I don't want to suggest to you what's the right view on this. I just want you to be aware that there's a lot of debate out there on, on this question of what's going on in this text. And many critics have responded in, in very different ways to it. Freud's Jewish readers, for instance, Jewish scholars have responded to it say differently than those who want who want to see Freud as a more uh, enlight, rational enlightenment thinker. Okay, now let's let's begin again because I don't want to assume that my my uh, listeners know too much about the biblical text because most of those people I teach at Western Washington University don't really come from any particular religious tradition. So let's read the, the, the key biblical text here that Freud's going to fo focus in on in Moses and Monotheism. This is from the book of Exodus 2, uh, verses 1 through 10. Uh, and, it, and the biblical text reads, and, and by the way, uh, in, in traditional Judaism, it's often said that Moses himself is the author of the Torah or the first five books of the uh, of what Christians call the Old Testament, what Jews call the Torah. And now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. This is going to be something important. We're going to come back to this question of Moses's Levite identity or Levite identity, because this is going to be very important to Freud uh, in his argument. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer uh, hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, she said, go. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Okay, now this, these are the most important biblical passages that, that Freud's going to focus in on. He's going to find this to be, uh, you know, problematic in, in certain senses in terms of thinking about who Moses was as he, as he uh, reimagines Moses, not as a Hebrew slave, but as an, as an Egyptian. And when he, when he thinks of the biblical text as a text that's 
that's wanting to make into Moses an Egyptian, into a Hebrew, but in fact he was Egyptian. This is what Freud's going to argue. So let's let's look at Freud's argument on this uh, case. And here you can see a painting of uh, an Egyptian woman drawing the baby out of the water. And there's the sister of, uh, of Moses who then fetches her mother and the baby is breastfed by his own mother. And so the biblical text makes Moses out to be a, a Hebrew, uh, the son of a Hebrew slave, but raised by Egyptian nobility and raised as an Egyptian. Okay, here's Freud's evidence. He focuses, for instance, on the etymology of, Fro of uh, Moses's name, which he's going to see is also linked to, similar to the name, a very common Egyptian name like Ramses, for instance, and it's at, in an etymological. And so Freud's going to say the biblical interpretation of the name says, he that was drawn out of the water, which we just saw in the passage from the Egyptian princess that found the baby in the reeds. And Freud's going to say it is nonsensical to credit an Egyptian princess with the knowledge of Hebrew etymology. The name Moses derives from the Egyptian vocabulary. It is simply the Egyptian word mos, meaning child, which is not uncommon on Egyptian monuments. So as you can see here, Freud's going to dismiss out of hand the idea that, uh, that, that a princess of Egypt would know Hebrew etymology and say, no, this is not, this is, this is silly. Uh, Moses is an Egyptian name and the child and also was uh, Egyptian in effect. Now, he then performs what we might call a structural analysis of the story or of the myth uh, of, of Moses being drawn from the water. And, and he's going to say, look, the legend, it's either an Egyptian, it has either an Egyptian or Jew, a Jewish or, origin. He's going to say the first supposition may be excluded. The Egyptians had no motive to glorify Moses. To them, he was not a hero. So the legend should have originated among the Jewish people. So he, he says, this is not a Egyptian legend. This is a Jewish legend. Okay, so they let us return to the two families in the myth. Uh, the, the, the little girl and her, or her mother who put the baby in the water and then the, the noble family of Egypt. They're distinguished as the noble and the humble, humble family. As a rule, the real family corresponds with the humble one the noble family with the fictitious one. In the case of Moses, something seems to be different, and here the new point of view may perhaps bring some illumination. It is that the first family, the one from which the babe is exposed to danger, is in all comparable cases the fictitious one. The second family, however, by which the hero is adopted and which he grows up is his real one. If we have the courage to accept this statement as a general truth to which the Moses legend is also suspect, then we suddenly see our way clear. Moses is an Egyptian, probably of noble origin, whom the myth undertakes to transform into a Jew. Moses was an Egyptian whom a people needed to make into a Jew. All right, so uh, he's going to say, you know, look, if, if you look at this myth, uh, or the way that the story is told, it's, it would seem to indicate even in its very structure that Moses himself was not uh, Jewish, but he was an Egyptian person who Jewish people needed to make into a Jew. All right, but he asked the question, what could have induced a distinguished Egyptian, perhaps a prince, a priest, or a high official, to place himself at the head of a throng of culturally inferior immigrants and to leave the country with him? is not easy to conjecture. And so we have a basic problem then that we have to ask, a historical problem. If, if the evidence of the text read, let's say, you know, in, in the light of reason rather than religious belief, seems to indicate that Moses was most likely an Egyptian rather than a Hebrew slave, well, we know that then that he, if he really did exist, we know that the Exodus really did take place from uh, Egypt when the Hebrew slaves left Egypt and, and went to the so-called land of milk and honey, why, what, we, we have to answer this basic question. Why would a, a, a distinguished Egyptian, a member of the nobility, in effect, uh, place himself at the head of a throng of culturally inferior immigrants and then decide to leave Egypt with them? Why not stay and enjoy his life of privilege and luxury? But then Freud's going to, 
uh, provide us with a, a very interesting answer to the question that he raises. Here's what he says. A strange fact in the history of the Egyptian religion, which was recognized and appraised relatively late, opens up another point of view. It is possible that the religion Moses gave to his Jewish people was not was yet his own uh, an Egyptian religion, though not the Egyptian one. In the glorious 18th century, when Egypt became for the first time a world power, a young pharaoh, Akhenaten, ascended to the throne about 1375 BCE, who first called himself Amotep IV, like his father, but later on changed his name and not only his name. The king undertook to force upon his subjects a new religion, one contrary to their ancient traditions and to all their familiar habits. It was a strict monotheism, the first one, first attempt of its kind in the history of the world, as far as we know, and religious intolerance, which was foreign to antiquity before this and for long after, was inevitably born with the belief in one God. So, okay, so if you don't know much about Egyptology, you, you may not know what he's talking about here, but it's it's quite interesting. The, the history of this is very interesting. Um, remember again, the Rosetta Stone, which was discovered you know, by the army of Napoleon in the aftermath of the Napoleonic conquest of, uh, of Egypt, and which provided the uh, the way to crack the code of the, of the ancient hieroglyphs so that they could be read. And let, let's remember the knowledge of how to read hieroglyphs was lost for almost 2,000 years, and suddenly uh, the hieroglyphs could be deciphered. And so it's only been relatively recently. Remember, you think of the context of when Freud was born and when he died, the you know, knowledge of the hieroglyphs uh, was only very, very uh, recently uh, gained. And so... Uh, a lot of history was learned in that period. And one of the things that was learned was that this, the, the, the strange history of this Pharaoh Akhenaten, who is, uh, again, setting aside the question of whether or not Moses uh, may or may not have been an Egyptian, was indeed the first known uh, monotheist. Now, apparently there were other monotheists, but prior even to Akhenaten in Egypt, but Akhenaten was the first uh, one that really uh, brought it in, into prominence and made it a part of Egypt's official policy. Now, just to just to give a little bit of background on this, what what you're looking at in this image is an image of the first um, known sign hieroglyph of God, and so this is an Egyptian hieroglyph. It is a flag wrapped in a uh, or a stick that's wrapped in a flag or wrapped in a, in a cloth. And so we think of the, the very first hieroglyph or sign writing in effect to send, signify God. It's interesting that it is a, a flag in effect. Now this is partly because for the ancient Egyptians, the temples of the Nile were the places where the gods dwelled. They would dwell within the temple and the flag would be the flag of the temple, which would mark the place of of the um, of of the deities, or, or the place where, in effect, the deity dwelled. And so, what we have to note here, I'm going to bring some terms up here that that are important to be aware of. And if you're not already familiar with these terms, you should look them up. Now, most of us have heard the term monotheism and polytheism. Polytheism, obviously, is having many gods. Monotheism is having just one God, but we, we want to be careful not to confuse henotheism with monotheism. And, I, and what many Egyptologists today will argue is that the Egyptians, uh, let's say prior to Akhenaten, they were not uh, monotheistic in the way that we think of monotheism, but they were henotheistic. Now, henotheism would be, in effect, a kind of a tolerant monotheism, which is to say, if you dwelled in a particular town, if you lived in a place where your God dwelled in the temple marked by the flag, then that God would be the, the one God for you and, and for all of the people who lived in that town, because this was the place where the God, in effect, dwelled. And then once a year, the, the, the deity would be brought out of the temple and prayed and then brought back in and, you know, and shrouded with, with the veil. And so the idea, and I'm, I'm saying this rather quickly, but the, the idea is that basically I have my God, you have your God. And so if I, 
have the God who, who dwells in the town where I dwell, and you have the God where the, the, you believe in the God that dwells in the town where, where you dwell, it doesn't mean that your God is not an actual God. It just means that that's your God for you and my God is for me. And so we each, we're both monotheists in the sense that we both just have one God. I have my God and you have your God. But my belief in my God does not uh, preclude uh, or exclude, I should say, the, you know, you having, uh, that the, the your God has some uh, reality as well. And so what, what Akhenaten really did, and we think of monotheism, which sort of comes down to us from Akhenaten, was in effect a kind of an intolerant monotheism in the sense that it, that, that when Akhenaten said there was only one God, it was his God, Aten, uh, he also said that every other god, for instance, Amon or Amon Ra, was was a was a false god, and that was what was so new and audacious is that Akhenaten forbade the worship of any other god except his god, and so he he promoted in effect an intolerant monotheism. And this, uh, you know, I mean, as as many Egyptologists like Eric Hornig and Jan Aspen will observe this. This created a great deal of, of resentment among those people who were were forbidden from worshiping the God that they loved and the God that they had, had always uh, worshipped. And, and the resentment was so strong that after Akhenaten's death, uh, he was uh, his, his name was was stricken from memory. His all of the statues to him were taken and deposited out in the desert that people just wanted to forget that he'd even existed. Well, ironically, this enabled many of the relics of Akhenaten to be uh, carefully preserved because they were removed and, and, and set aside like this. And so as it turns out, we know perhaps more about Akhenaten than any other pharaoh because his, uh, his, his the statues to him and, and the remnants of his uh, intolerant monotheistic belief were, were deposited you know, far away. And uh, uh, you know, left to be discovered many years later by Egyptologists. And so this this is the monotheism that uh, Freud is investigating, the monotheism of Akhenaten. And as we're going to see, he's going to argue that whoever this Egyptian Moses was, it's most likely that he was a a, a, a follower. He wasn't Akhenaten, but he was he would have been a, a, an Egyptian nobleman who would have. Uh, who would have embraced the teachings of Akhenaten and would have not been very happy after Akhenaten's teachings were um, were, uh, were were rejected by the remaining uh, people who lived in Egypt? Well, well, let's let's we'll look at that argument uh, from Freud. But here you can see an Im images of Akhenaten. Now there in the middle, you see Akhenaten. You might note the sun. Now Akhenaten was his one god was a sun god and. Uh, and Freud's going to note too that one of the sort of Jewish innovations in you know post Akhenaten was that you know that that although the the Hebrew slaves the followers of Moses worshipped one God that God was not literally the sun as it was for Akhenaten but it would have been a more akin to an idea of a transcendental uh, deity uh, but Akhenaten's one true God. You know, was was the sun? We think of what Akhenaten, this name that he changed to, them, it, that he uh, embraced, and when he took this new name, it means basically we could think of it. If we put it in contemporary terms, we could think of it as sort of a prophet of Aten. His god was Aten, and 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 you know, if we can think of the Islamic profession of faith, which is there is no god but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Well, this is a this profession is articulated, you know, some six hundred years after Christ, and be you know two thousand years after Akhenaten, uh, but but it's very similar in the sense that what Akhenaten said was there is no god but God. In effect, there is no god but Aten, his god, and and At Akhenaten would be his prophet or his his principal teacher. Now I, I note too that if you look at the the statues of Akhenaten that were found, one of the interesting things about them that are very different from other uh, Egyptian pharaohs. Is that they, that Akhenaten? You might you might notice he has a very feminine uh, bodily shape, and so he he he's often depicted as bearing the characteristics of both genders. So he's something of a hermaphroditic figure, which I think is also uh, somewhat interesting to note a figure who 
overcomes gender binaries as well. So he, he was a very interesting figure, but like I said, he stirred up a lot of resentment after he uh, died and, and the, the Egyptians that were so angry at him for forbidding them from worshiping their preferred deities wanted to forget that he'd ever existed. But, but for Freud, this would not have been the case with this Egyptian Moses who wanted to keep the Akhenaten religion alive. And this would have been a primary motive for his willingness to lead this, uh, these, these group of uh, Hebrew slaves out of, uh, out of Egypt on, on the Exodus to this new uh, promised land. Okay, let's read Freud on this. He says, the persecution of the king, excuse me, the, excuse me, the persecution by the king Akhenaten was directed foremost against Amon, Amon Ra. Now remember Amon, the sword of Amon, we get that this is even like, for instance, in the Lord's Prayer, you say, uh, at the end of every prayer, you say, amen. This is, amen. This is etymologically linked to this figure of Amon. He was a very important uh, uh, Egyptian deity, which was persecuted by Akhenaten. It was, but it was not just him, other deities too. Everywhere in the empire, the temples were closed, services forbidden, and the ecclesiastical property seized. Indeed, the king's zeal, Akhenaten's zeal, went so far as to cause an inquiry to be made into the inscriptions on old monuments in order to efface the word God wherever it was used in the plural. So you could no longer, during Akhenaten's reign, you could no longer say gods. You had to say God. Then there followed a period of anarchy until the general uh, Haramhab succeeded in 1350 BC in restoring order. The glorious 18th uh, dynasty of Akhenaten was extinguished. Now in this sad interregnum, Egypt's old religions were reinstated. The Aten religion was at an end. Akhenaten's capital lay destroyed and plundered and his memory was scorned as that of a felon. And then Freud's going to say, I will venture now to draw the following conclusion. If Moses was an Egyptian, and if he transmitted to the Jews his own religion, then it was that of Akhenaten, the Aten religion. The Mosaic religion is nothing else but that of Aten. Okay, so now you can see why he's saying, you know, he's, he's taking, he's, at the beginning of the text, he says, this is a very bold undertaking because I'm denying the Jewish people, of which I'm one, he says, uh, of their most important prophet. I'm saying that their most important prophet was not even Jewish, but was uh, Egyptian. And this is a, a very audacious claim indeed, a very provocative and audacious claim. Okay, but there are other uh, instances of this. I might note here in passing the, uh, points that Freud makes. We can't go too far into this here, but he notes that Jewish monotheism is in some points even more uncompromising than the Egyptian uh, monotheism. In this sense, he means uh, the monotheism of, uh, of, of Akhenaten, not, of the, not the henotheism of uh, the Egyptians before Akhenaten. For example, when it forbids all visual representation of its God. Now, Jan Aspen makes this same point in his book, uh, Moses the Egyptian, that uh, the, the Ju Judaic religion is in effect a counter religion and what it counters is the religion of the ancient Egyptians. And this is interesting to contemplate that the so-called Ten Commandments are really not even comprehensible without understanding the historical context of what uh, that they are, of, of which they're responding or the religion that they're negating, which in this case is the Egyptian religion. So we think of Moses throwing down the law on, on the golden calf. Well, Judaism in its inception has a very iconoclastic dimension or icon smashing dimension to it. And this is also true of, of the Akhenaten religion as well. And so this, this tells us something about the origins also for Freud of, of the ban on graven images or the second commandment of the Ten Commandments. And here, which, which by the way, is, is eliminated in the Christian tradition, uh, but preserved in Judaism and Islam. Uh, the reasons for its elimination of Christianity are, can't go into that here, but if you listen to my lectures on scriptural literature, I go into that in some detail. But here's the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. This is the second of the Ten Commandments, which again is, is 
true also of the Akhenaten a religion uh, in the sense that no other images can be made except those referring to Aten and it's true it becomes true in Judaic uh, monotheism as well now here you can see an image a painting of Moses uh, with coming down with his uh, with his with the law that he receives on Sinai the Ten Commandments and finds that in the time that he's been gone uh, getting the law on the mountain his people have slipped back into this worship uh, this idol worship the Egyptians commonly had uh, statues to calves much like the calf that's being constructed and so this would be a kind of a from Moses's perspective they they were regressing to the re religion of the Egyptians that he was trying to get them to stop, uh, you know, uh, worshiping. Okay, another important uh, innovation that comes into Judaism through Egypt is circumcision. And this is a really important part of Freud's argument is that while circumcision is historically associated in the biblical tradition with the Abrahamic covenant, uh, it's in fact far older than the Abrahamic covenant. It's, it, it goes back to ancient Egypt and even prehistory. So the, the ancient Egyptians commonly practiced circumcision, although it's tends to be identified with the Abrahamic covenant in both say Judaism and uh, Islam as well. Uh, in fact, it was a very common practice among the Egyptians. And the suggestion here then is that it enters, it becomes a part of Judaism because of the, influence of this Egyptian Moses. Here's what Freud says. He says, Moses gave the Jews not only a new religion, it is equally certain that he introduced the custom of circumcision. In the biblical account, circumcision dates the custom, excuse me, it dates the custom back to the time of the patriarchs as a sign of the covenant concluded between God and Abraham. The fact remains that the question concerning the origin of circumcision has only one answer. It comes from Egypt. Herodias, the father of history, tells us that the custom of circumcision had long been practiced in Egypt, and this statement has been confirmed by the examination of mummies and even by the drawings on the walls of the graves you know, in, in Egypt. And, and indeed, that's true. If you look to the left here on the top and the bottom, you can see a papyrus of circumcision and uh, an image on the bottom on, on the Temple Nile and temples of the Nile. Uh, you, you see this is very common image of circumcision taking place. And so, you know, Freud says if circumcision was a custom meant to distinguish the Jews from the people around them, he says he calls it a particularly clumsy invention because it was so, you know, widely practiced, but it was practiced very specifically in Egypt. And so for Freud, circumcision uh, does not begin with the Abrahamic covenant, but it begin, but it comes into the, uh, the, uh, Judaic religion via uh, Egypt and the influence of the Egyptian Moses. Now to the right, you see on the top, you see an image of uh, a painting, a medieval painting of the prophet Abraham, who is circumcising himself as, as a part of the covenant. We can't get into that here, but that's a very, very important part of, of, of the passage in the, in the book of Genesis. And the idea of covenant as being, you know, the circumcision being a sign of of the covenant or a sign of the promise is becomes a major feature of the Judaic tradition. And it remains there today. That's true today. And it's true of the Islamic tradition as well, which is linked to the Abrahamic and Christianity. Circumcision is uh, superseded by baptism, but one still in that case speaks of circumcision of the heart, say for instance, in the Pauline tradition. So if you're, if you, if you study any of the Abrahamic traditions, you have to spend some time meditating on the question of what circumcision is. And this is also a very important part of psychoanalysis, too, at least in the way that Freud articulates it. But here, Freud's arguing, again, that it comes into Judaism via this Egyptian Moses. He states, if Moses gave the Jews not only a new religion, but also the law of circumcision, he was no Jew, but an Egyptian. And then the Mosaic religion was probably an Egyptian one. Uh, uh, if we place Moses in Akhenaten's period and associate him with the Pharaoh, then the enigma is resolved answering all our questions. Let us assume that Moses was a noble and distinguished man, perhaps indeed a member of the royal house, as the myth has it. He must have been conscious of his great abilities. 
Ambitious and energetic, perhaps he saw himself in a dim future as the leader of his people. In close contact with Pharaoh, he was a, he was a convinced adherent of the new religion, whose basic principles he fully understood and had made his own. With Akhenaten's death and the subsequent reaction, he saw all his hopes and prospects destroyed. Moses' active nature conceived the plan of founding a new empire, of founding, finding a new people to whom he could give the religion that Egypt disdained. This is all very theoretical. It's, it's a very interesting yarn that he spins, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's underwritten by Freud's years of training in psychoanalysis. And this one, again, as I said, that, uh, that many, have, many Egyptologists have found to be uh, compelling, but he approaches it kind of like a detective story as he's trying to uncover the truth about who Moses was, but he's, he's not doing it with the appeal to uh, religious authority, but with the appeal to reason in effect. Now, okay, uh, one other important aspect of his argument that he makes is the question of the Levites. He's gonna associate Moses with the Levites. Now, here you can see, again, another genealogy of the 12, tribes of uh, Israel. Now, Israel was the name that Jacob took after he wrestled with the angel. If you see here, Abraham, Sarah, and then down to Isaac and Rebekah, and there's Jacob. Now, Jacob had two main wives, Leah and Sarah, excuse me, Leah and Rachel, and then they had servants whom he had relations with as well. But out of these unions came what come to be known as the 12 tribes of Israel in, in the biblical text. You'll find this in the book of Genesis. Now, if you look from Jacob, who becomes Israel, and the word Israel means wrestler, one who wrestles with the angel, which is the new name that he gets. You can see when he, that his wife Leah, her third son is Levi. And so this is said to be the lineage, the link to Jacob from which Moses comes. Now, when the, when the uh, Israelites go into Egypt originally in the time of the famine, the, the their Jacob's preferred son is Joseph. You can see him there, number uh, 11, Joseph. And there are many stories in the Bible and the Quran about Joseph. And in fact, when they, when they return to the land of milk and honey, they, they're said or to Palestine after many years of living in Egypt, they're said to bring back the body of, of Joseph with them. But Moses does not trace his lineage through Joseph. It's said in the biblical text to come through Levi and this question: the Levites are this this priestly caste in Israel, and in and in the and in the literature, the scriptural literature of Israel, and the Judaic tradition. And so Freud is, you know, wondering about this. And so he's going to have just like with the question of circumcision and the figure of Moses, he's going to have a very interesting thesis about the question of of the Levites. So let's see what he says. He says among the greatest riddles of Jewish prehistoric times is that concerning is that concerning the antecedents of the Levites. They are said to have been derived from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi. But no tradition has ever ventured to pronounce on where that tribe originally dwelt or what portion of the conquered country of Canaan had been allotted to it. All right, so that's the traditional view. But he's going to say, now our supposition or Freud's supposition about the person of Moses suggests an explanation. It is, not, is it, it is not credible that a great gentleman like the Egyptian Moses approached a people strange to him without an escort. He must have brought his retinue, retinue with him, his natural adherents, his scribes, his servants. These were the original Levites. Tradition maintains that Moses was a Levite. And so, okay, so Moses would have had a retinue or he would have had his little group of people who would have been his family members, people like him who would, would have been Egyptians. And they were in some sense priestly because they were set aside. So he's going to say this, the status of the set aside group was because they weren't like, even ethnically, they weren't like the, uh, the, the other uh, Hebrew slaves who, who went into the Exodus. They were a group that was set aside. And so he's going to say this set aside group would have been this, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the companions or the escort of the Egyptian Moses and themselves would have been Egyptian. Now, 
Uh, he's also going to argue that, you know, Moses is described in the biblical text as being someone who was poor of speech or was not an eloquent speaker. And so often uh, Aaron is said to speak for him. Now, one Freud's view on this is going to be, well, the reason why Moses was described as somebody who was not a very eloquent speaker is probably because he didn't even speak the language of the uh, of those he was leading, and and if he did, he spoke it badly, and so he had to speak to a spokesman, which was Aaron. This would have been again for Freud more evidence of uh, Moses's Egyptian uh, origin, and so I want to also now point to uh, another aspect of this argument. This is where it gets a little complicated. We'll try to keep this simple, but he's going to argue then that the that this group of people that uh, that, that Akhenaten's uh, former disciple, this Egyptian Moses, lead out of Egypt. They pass through the Sinai area from, from the Nile area into the Sinai and then into what would be Palestine. And when they, when they come to Sinai, they encounter uh, the adherence of, of a volcano god. And so we get this other god. When we, when we speak of the god, you know, let's say that writes with a finger of fire, on the Ten Commandments, or or the God that is associated with 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 volcanic eruptions. So the the the, the God Yahweh in the biblical text, we, we get with these stories in Exodus of Moses receiving the law and talking to this burning bush on the mountain. This, the, what, what's called the theophany of the name, or the name uh, is is revealed. The name of God is revealed to Moses, which is this name Yahweh or Jehovah, and. Um, in the, in the earlier biblical text, we get what's called the Elohim tradition. So we get a name of God associated with this, with the name of Elo, God being associated with this, the name of Elohim. But here the name is revealed as Yahweh. So we get these two different names of God. And so this is for Freud going to be evidence of this, uh, of how this group of, of, of people who came out of Egypt would have encountered this other group who worshipped a volcanic deity. They would have been a more cruder uh, group of people, less cultured, but that he sees these two groups coming together to form uh, one group. And uh, they would have had two different distinct founders, but he's going to argue that the figure of Moses becomes conflated with the identity, or these two figures becomes conflated into the figure of this one person, Moses. So let's let's look at what he says about this. He says, at the time of the union of the followers of, of Javeh or Jehovah, Yahweh, the Levites formed an influential minority, culturally superior to the rest. Since the Moses people or Levites attached such great importance to their experience of the exodus from Egypt, the deed of freeing them had to be ascribed to uh, to, to Jehovah. It had to be adorned with features that proved the terrific grandeur of this volcano god. The bestowal of the Ten Commandments, too, was said to have taken place at the foot of the holy mountain amid the signs of, all the, of a volcanic eruption. This description, however, did a serious wrong to the memory of the man Moses. It was he and not the volcano god who had freed his people from Egypt. The God Jehovah to whom Moses had led a new people was probably in no way a remarkable being, a rude, narrow-minded, local God, violent and bloodthirsty. He had promised his adherents to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, and he encouraged them to rid the country of its present inhabitants with the edge of the sword. Okay, so... Uh, let's continue. Moses was keeping the flock of his father. This is actually uh, what I'm reading now is the biblical description of Moses on, um, on on the mountain when he comes into contact with this uh, volcanic deity. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. Okay, so this is where we get these images of fire being associated with, with the God of Moses. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush and 
Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. This would be God speaking. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I, sh I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship on this mountain. So this would be for Freud a bit of reconstructive history, but it would have some basis in actual historical events that, that took place when these two different groups of people merged to form this new uh, people. And here's Freud's going to say, I may now express my conclusion in the shortest formula. To the well-known duality of that history, two peoples who fused together to form one nation, two kingdoms, into which this nation divides. Two names for the deity in the source of the Bible, Elohim and Yahweh. We may add two new ones, the founding of two religions, the first one ousted by the second, and yet appearing victorious. Two founders of religion who are called both by the same name, Moses. So now let's, let's look here on this map. You can see um, the... Uh, you know, what, what the geographical territory looks like that we're, we're talking about here. And uh, as, as you can see, um, you know, there's the Nile and then there's the Sinai Peninsula. This would be where this uh, volcanic deity would, would, would have been located. And then as you can see in the red there, this is going to later be identified as the, in the, this is a biblical rendering of, of the or from a rendering of the description of what the borders of Israel would have been in terms of what how the promised land was described in the biblical text this is something that we'll need to uh, come back to uh, but um, the land the so-called land of milk and honey would be in what is today modern day Israel Palestine the West Bank uh, those those borders there where many, I mean, for instance, it's on the border of modern day Israel and Jordan, but on the Jordanian side where Moses was said to have finally uh, disappeared. Uh, and um, you can, you can visit there. There's, there's, that's part of the you know, tours that people take to the, uh, to the Holy Land. And you can see there in the middle, you can see where the Ar Armana Akhenaten religions were were located. So this, I hope these, this will give you some sense geographically of, of what this land is that we've been talking about from Freud's lecture. So, all right, so let's, let's look at it. We'll take a couple of concluding remarks here. Um, now we're not, we're not in this lecture, we're not focusing on book three because book, we're only looking at parts one and two. Part three of this book would take us in a very different direction. But again, I do have lectures on that that you can you can watch if you're interested but here we find after you know freud ventures this very provocative thesis the situation for him gets worse in in, in terms of him and it finally leads to where he has to flee vienna and go to uh, england where he concludes this book in london the first part being written in vienna but so he so i this is the concluding remarks of this lecture but the, the quote that I'm taking is from the first pages of part three, where he says, we live in remarkable times. We find with astonishment that progress has concluded an alliance with barbarism. He's talking here about the rise of, of the Third Reich and what's happened in Germany in the, in the post. I mean, we, this period of enlightenment has happened uh, in Germany as well as in France. But now he says something terrible has happened in Germany. Germany. 
place of the Enlightenment has, has receded into a kind of a barbarism. He says, formerly I lived in Vienna under the protection of the Catholic Church, and I feared that by publishing the essay, the one that we've just been discussing on Moses, I should lose that protection. And then suddenly the German invasion, Nazis, broke in on us, and Catholicism proved to be, as the Bible has it, but a broken reed. In the certainty of persecution, now not only because of my work, but because of my race, I left with many friends the city from which early childhood through 78 years had been home to me. So uh, he, you know, he's now, he says, formerly, he, you know, he had a hard enough time being persecuted because of his controversial ideas. And Freud, of course, to, even today remains a controversial figure. But now he faced this other form of persecution just simply because of who he was, not because of what his ideas were, what his so-called race was. And he, but this leads him to ponder more on the motives for anti-Semitism. He says, the deeper motives of anti-Semitism have their roots in times long past. They come from the unconscious. It's a very prominent Freudian thesis, the existence of the unconscious, ideas that are repressed, buried in, in the unconscious that continue to influence us, even if we're not aware of it. And I'm quite prepared to hear that what I, I'm going to say will at first appear incredible. I venture to assert that the jealousy which the Jews evoked in other peoples by maintaining that they were the firstborn favorite child of God the Father has not yet been overcome by those others, just as the latter had given credence to the assumption. Furthermore, among the customs through which the Jews marked off their aloof position, that of circumcision made a disagreeable, uncanny impression on others. The explanation probably is that it reminds them of the dreaded castration and idea of things that their primitive of their primitive past, which they would fain forget. Okay, just very briefly to uh, unpack this, um, Europeans, by you know historically, even you know long before the diaspora and Jews coming into Europe, have did not practice circumcision, and so Jews continued to practice circumcision in Europe. Now, circumcision is widely practiced in Africa and the Middle East, but in Europe, it became a marker of difference since European peoples did not practice it. And historically, even you know, if we go back to the time of the ancient Greeks, many Greeks looked at the custom with abhorrence, and this is you know one of the reasons why when Christianity, which was a sect of Judaism, spreads into Europe. Uh, literal circumcision becomes dropped or superseded by figurative circumcision, so one doesn't have to become circumcised. And historically, European peoples are not circumcised, although Jews and Muslims continue to be circumcised. circumcised and Freud's going to, but Freud's going to attribute here um, certain unconscious feelings uh, among Europeans to, you know, their, their, uh, you know, he links this to castration anxiety. And I, I don't want to get too far into this. Uh, today, because that would get us into complex issues of Freudian theory we don't have time for. But I just want you to be aware of that aspect of his uh, argument. And then he's going to say, and I think this is what's most important for our purposes, we must not forget that all the peoples who excel in the practice of anti-Semitism, uh, because Christians only in relatively uh, recent times, sometimes forced to it by bloody compulsion. They have not yet overcome their grudge against the new religion, which was forced on them, and they have projected it onto the source from which Christianity came to them. The facts that the Gospels tell a story which is enacted among Jews, and in truth treats only of Jews, has facilitated such a projection. The hatred for Judaism is at bottom hatred for Christianity, and it is not surprising that in the German Nationalist Socialist Revolution, the Nazi Revolution, this close connection of the two monolithic religions finds such clear expression in the hostile treatment of both. It is as if Egypt has come to wreak her vengeance on the heirs of Akhenaten. Okay, very fascinating argument here. Um, and this is one that Jan Osman is going to pick up on in his book, Moses the Egyptian, and that is that essentially... Um, you know, that the ancient world up to the present has experienced the imposition of intolerant monotheism as a trauma. And so, 
Um, and, and it is true. The point that Freud is making here is quite true, is that the Nazi party, the National Socialist Movement, were not only hostile to Jews. Now, of course, Jews got treated most terribly, uh, but they were, it was also quite hostile to Christianity. I think it was something like, you know, 10% of those who ended up in the camps were, in effect, Christians. And, um, and so, but he's going to say, really, you know, that, that what's going on here is that there, there are all kinds of uh, unconscious, you know, resentments that have, uh, that, that continue to linger in, in the unconscious of, of those people. And Jews are bearing the brunt of that. This is one speculation that he's having, which he links to, you know, to the rise of the Akhenaten religion is going to say this, that, that in effect, it's quite interesting if you consider what he's saying, because in effect, the same kind of dynamic that took place in ancient Egypt when the uh, generation after Akhenaten struck his name from the record and, you know, for, in, and, and returned to their original worship of the gods that they preferred, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a, a repeat of history is what he's essentially saying here. Okay, well, we're at the conclusion of this lecture. I show, I'm just showing you here. These are some images of the Freud House in London. This is Freud as an old man as he migrated to London. This is where he went to from uh, Vienna, and um, and it's still there. You can visit this museum in uh, in London. And I would also just in closing note, just let me remind you, I have three other lectures on this channel on Freudian animal metamorphosis and Freud's totem and taboo. And I also have a QA and a session on Freud and Derrida. And all of these address the argument that is set forth in book three of Moses and monotheism, which is also linked to Freud's book, Totem and Taboo. So I'm not covering that in this lecture, but I do have other lectures here on this channel that you can watch if you're interested in, uh, in, in learning more about that.